going to give you a snapshot of what we do this afternoon. And those of you who are members will have seen the last edition of News and Views. And uh, I hope you had a good opportunity to read it. And as uh, Janet mentioned, World Loops Day is coming up and there's a, <coughs> a poster enclosed with that. But what is Lupus UK? Well, Lupus UK is the national charity for people with lupus. So can you all hear me all right? No, 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 no. no. Anyway. Is that better? No. No? Oh, well. Is that better? Okay, sorry about that technical glitch. Lucky I have Paul here. <laughs> right, so we're the national charity for people with lupus in the United Kingdom. That's not just for our members, it's for everybody who's got lupus in the four home nations. And we also have a few members from overseas as well. We're registered with the Charity Commission and we're also a member of the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, OSCAR. We have over 5,000 members overall. 500 of you are in Scotland. We're based in Romford in Essex, where we have a staff of, at the moment, four full-time and two part-time. Ah. Well, I've just said that. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be a good prompt, but I've obviously got to be carried away. Right, our vision. A world where people with lupus can lead full and active lives. And our mission to empower people by providing information about lupus and offering support so their voices are heard and their condition diagnosed and managed effectively. It's not an easy thing to do. I was talking earlier at the AGM. The vision is a very long term thing, and we're probably looking at decades away before cure is found for lupus because it, because it is so, so very complex. So many different facets. What we can do with regard to our mission is we can make incremental steps along the way to help you along. So one of the things I said earlier was that when you were diagnosed, I bet nearly all of you didn't know anybody else who had lupus. So one thing we can actually do is bring you together. And that's why lots of you are here today, which is, is fantastic. So support for people with lupus is one of the main strands of the work that we do. Bringing people together, providing lupus information and assisting those seeking a diagnosis. People are poorly, they want a label for it, and I can understand that. You might want lupus, but you want a label one way or the other, and you want to get treatment. You want to inform the public and the medical profession about lupus. Because unless the medical members of that profession know about lupus, deal with lupus patients, there's a lot out there who don't know much about lupus. And GPs get a lot of stick sometimes for not knowing about lupus, but you've got to be fair they treat a lot of other conditions and the way lupus presents can be very difficult for them to pinpoint it. But what we do ask is that they have an open mind and if they think it's lupus, to refer appropriately. We signpost to other organisations. Um, as I said earlier, we've got a very, very small team. Um, we can provide a lot of information but we will signpost, particularly on things like benefits. It's an absolute minefield, as you probably know. Um, there's been a lot of changes recently. Very hard to keep up with. Publications, I mentioned that all our members get a copy of Lupus UK News and Views. And that also goes to a lot of hospitals, to lots of doctors and lots, and lots of nurses. And of course, in this 21st century, the website is so very, very important because that is a window into a huge world for lots and lots of people. You can access, access that anywhere from home, etc. So I'll 
I mentioned the website, social media. This has been a huge growth area, particularly since Paul joined us, because we did not have the expertise in the office to undertake that. And so much so that we have 18,500 likes on Facebook, which is far higher than our membership of 5,000. On Twitter, 5,500 people joining, and followers on Health Unlocked, another 11,000. So these are all ways of bringing you together. People prefer different ways of doing things, so there's different options there for you. We have over 100 telephone contacts. If you look in the back of your news and views, you will see that there's a list of them. Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, England, and the Isle of Man, and a few young contacts. These people are lupus experts, they're like you. They've got lupus, they live with it. And some of those contacts are also carers and partners of people with lupus. So they, in a sense, live with it as well. And the more people understand, the better it is for everyone. We send information packs out on request. Not quite as many as we used to, because people access a lot of the information they require from the website and the internet. But we also offer a wide range of publications, and they you'll see some of those dotted around the room. Over in the second alcove over there, there's all our fact sheets and different aspects of blueprints. All those publications, if they haven't done so already, are going through the information <coughs> standards, so they have been peer-reviewed by medical professionals and end-user reviewed by people with lupus, so they meet a very high standard of information. That sounds straightforward, but trust me, it can take months to get a single leaflet through to publication. It takes a long time. I thought I'd use this as a, as, as a prompt, but I seem to be racing ahead of myself anyway, but nevertheless, the important thing is to get the information across. So, I think we've covered that. that. Right. So, raising lupus awareness. Now, support is one side of the equation, the other side is raising awareness, because unless people are aware of lupus, they can't support it. Um, this is done through the membership, people like good sales, through regional and local lupus groups. I mentioned the website and social media again, the telephone, Lupus Awareness Month in October, and World Lupus Day on the 10th of May. Now, for those of you who've, who've looked at the website recently, what we try to do every Lupus Awareness Month and every World Lupus Day is produce a video clip. I don't know why we call them video clips in this day and age, but everybody seems to understand what that means. And over the last few years, since 2012, we've done this. And we've got a new one coming out on World Lupus Day next week. But the interesting thing is, we've got two which are animated. And for some reason, I'm touched. Second. <laughs> <laughs> um, for some reason, the animated clips attract more attention. I think one of them is about 110,000 views, which is absolutely fantastic. So there's a lot of people got interested in, in, in those. So, whilst we have real people in the next video clip, we're, we'll, we'll plan to have another animated clip on, on an aspect of lupus in Lupus Awareness Month, either this year or, or next year. But again, it takes a while to pull these things together. Media releases, we've got a huge database of media organisations. So, last Thursday, before he left the office, Paul sent out the information about the World Lupus Day. And I think as you've heard already, we've already had one bite on that with STV, which is absolutely fantastic, and we hope to get more. So we are seeing more and more lupus-related articles and information in the media in its various forms. Raising lupus awareness, attendance at various medical and other conferences. As Janet was saying, I tend to go to the British Society of Rheumatology meeting every spring and it moves around the UK, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, and as you said, it so happened to be Glasgow last week. So uh, 
my car knows its way to Glasgow, no trouble <coughs> at the moment. But the, the importance of that is that it's the one place where we get to see all the medical professionals who we speak to throughout the year, because they all attend that conference. And there is one very exciting development coming along. I can't tell you too much about it at the moment, because it's early days. But it involved myself, a couple of other smaller charities, and the BSR, meeting with the new president of the BSR, Dr. Peter Lanyon, who has a strong interest in lupus. So we're hoping that we can raise awareness of lupus in other channels. Now, raising internet awareness is very important, but to do all these things, we need money. And you have seen on the slideshow beforehand pictures of people running the London Marathon, going the extra mile, and various other events. And I want to pay tribute to everybody who does all these wonderful things, because without you, we won't be able to do the things that we're able to do. And part of our biggest expenditure, if we've got the money, we'll spend it, but we'll spend it in the right way. And that is on research and lupus specialist nurses. Since 1992, £7.6 million pounds has been raised and spent on lupus research, various aspects, and lupus nurses. And what we're trying to do every year is put in place another lupus nurse. The year before last, a lupus nurse in Leicester. Last year, a lupus nurse in North Wales, and I think it was last year, beginning of last year, after it took a while to get in place, you've got a lupus nurse in the west of Scotland, Hare Myers Hospital, I believe, I'm not too sure of the geography, it might be East, East Kilbride, some of you probably know that better than I do, um, but that nurse is being paid for by your hard-earned fundraising and also by, partly by another trust who gave us money specifically to spend on a lupus nurse in Scotland. And we hope in due course to have other lupus nurses, especially lupus nurses in Scotland as well. That figure of 7.6 million up until yesterday was 7.3 million because the trustees had a meeting yesterday and seven research grants were approved totally for £300,000. As I mentioned, we need money to do all these things, and from a great variety of different areas, we get donations, sponsored events. I was talking earlier about uh, a gentleman in North Wales who lost his wife a few years ago, and to do his bit and certainly be remembered, when he was 70, he did a parachute. <laughs> Five years later, when he was 75, he did another parachute jump. And last year, when he was 80, he did another parachute jump. So guess what he's doing now? Yep, he's planning for when he's 85 to do another parachute jump. I have to admit, you wouldn't get me doing that. I don't, I don't, I don't mind cycling. Paul doesn't mind running, but we're not over keen on heights, I suspect. But, um, but that, that is an indication of the dedication of some people and the support that they give the UK and for all the work that we endeavour to do. So sponsored events. The London Marathon, we Janine organises the team there. We have golden bonds, which means that we're always guaranteed places and there's always a lot of competition for them. And a lot of char charities can't get them, but we've got them and we're going to hang on to them. But in addition to those golden bond runners, we had more runners, about 53 runners this year. And they were all met at the London Marathon exhibition the week before last to have their photograph taken for news and views. And the money has been pouring in from their efforts on just giving and by other means. But it's not just the London Marathon, it's marathons up and down the land. I think there's an Edinburgh Marathon. Is there a Glasgow Marathon? I'm sure that there must be somewhere on the line. Um, the Great North Run, Great South Run, you name it. Appeals. We write appeals letters, sometimes referred to as begging letters, to lots of grant-making trusts. And over the last couple of years, our income from that source has increased and again that takes time and effort for every one letter every I suppose hundred letters you get you might get one positive response but unless you ask you don't necessarily get it and that takes time and effort. A lot of you know, most of us pay tax unfortunately but if you're given a donation you can 
gift aid it so we can get a little bit of money back off the government because we don't get government support at all. And we also have a variety of saleable items as you'll see on the sales table over there. So overall, for a small charity, we, we cover an awful lot of bases. And Paul will agree with me on this. You can walk into the office in the morning wearing one hat, and throughout the day you probably wear a dozen others. Because things come from all angles. And not only have we got to look after all our supporters, our members, and raise awareness about loopholes, but there are obviously certain type of regulatory things that you have to do. You have to be returning to the Charities Commission, look at the accounts, all this and all the rest of it. All this takes time and effort, but it's worth it for the amount of output that we can gain and the information that we can get out there. So, I'm not quite sure how I'm doing for time, but I'm not going to, 16 minutes, I've got at 20. As I, as I said, this is really a snapshot of what we do. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I'll be available in the tea break, and I'll try and answer them. That's all I can promise. Um, I'd like to conclude by saying a big thank you to you, our members, to our donors, to our fundraisers, and other supporters in all shapes and forms for all the wonderful things they do for us. And we try to spend that money wisely. And just in final conclusion, last year the trustees committed £770,000 to lupus research and lupus nurses, that was 62% of our income, which I thought was a pretty good total. Thank you very much.